We have a podcast. Diving, diving deep. deep. Diving deep into all things Texas. Both on and off the field. Here's Sean Pendergast. And Pro Football Hall of Famer, the General. Sean McClain. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Utopia. Yeah, right now it's week nine and we got the Bucks. And John, as always, before every Texans game, we preview it by doing the pregame six pack. Uh, six. People, players, storylines, position groups, whatever the case, that are going to impact this game on Sunday. Game at noon, by the way, on Sunday. You can hear it on Sports Radio 610. Texans Countdown starts at 9 a.m. That would be me and Seth Payne on Texans Countdown. John, let's get to the six-pack. And as always, the honor is yours. Thank you, John. Uh, One of the things the Texans have been doing a great job of stopping the run. And they were the worst in the NFL over the last three years. They gave up 170 yards last season, 5.1 a carry. Now they're giving up 3.6 a carry. They're giving up 99 yards, and they're 11th. And what's amazing about this, over the last five games, they're giving up 91.8 and 3.4 a carry. Over the last three games, 76.3 and 2.7. The Bucs don't run the ball well. They're 30th. They average 77.9 yards rushing. So the idea, shut down the run, force Baker Mayfield to pass, get after him like they did uh, Bryce Young, and then something they didn't do in Carolina, they didn't force turnover. They got to help the offense. Offense passed and has been struggling. They got to get a couple of turnovers, shorten the field to put the offense in good position. But I think the defensive improvement and in this game has got to start with stopping the run again. Yeah, the quarterbacks are going to probably decide this game, and we'll get into them, I'm sure, as we go through this six-pack. But along those lines, John, as poorly as Tampa Bay has been running the football and as well as the Texans have been defending it, my first one is going to be the flip side to that, the Texans running the football against Tampa Bay's defense. And looking at it more from a Texans perspective, as you and I are recording this, um, Damian Pierce missed practice on Wednesday with an ankle injury. I don't know what his status was or is for practice today. They may be on the practice field now as you and I are talking. Um, but the it, it sounded like at least some of the rumblings were that he could miss the game on Sunday. John, I actually – I'm not – I'm not terribly disappointed by this. I'm disappointed because I like Damian Pierce and he's a good football player. No question about that. But I started thinking about, okay, why am I not as as upset about Damian Pierce possibly missing a game for the Texans as I know I would have been this time last year, like super upset? And it's, John, because his backup this year is not... Uh, Rex Bleeping Burkhead. Thank you, John. Yes, yeah, the drop-off from Damian to the next running back is not nearly as stark health. Some would argue that there is no drop-off between Damian Pierce and Devin Singletary. So my my item in the six-pack is how do these carries get doled out? With or without Damian Pierce, how do they get doled out? Because even Mike Boone, on the couple times he touched the ball last week, did some good things. But I'm intrigued to see if there is no Damian Pierce. What does this offense look like with Devin Singletary probably getting the lion's share of the carries and Mike Boone as the change of pace third-down guy? Um, that intrigues me, and I and and I think there's a chance the Texans might actually run the football a little bit better. We'll see. But I'm not nearly as – as um, I don't have nearly the agita I would have last year if we were missing Damian. If you're missing Damian Pierce last year, there goes your run game completely. Um, run game's not been great this year. So if this shakes it up a little bit, then so be it. Let's see what happens. I'm guessing that Pierce is going to be out. Singletary will start. Boone will get carries. And this time next week we'll be going, man, I'm glad – Damian Pierce is back. They can't run because the run blocking up front is awful. They lead the league in having a guy in the backfield uh, quicker than anybody in the league, anybody in the NFL. Now they're going to have more changes in their offensive line. Laramie Tunzel could be out with a knee injury. Josh Jones has been running first team left tackle. That's scary. Michael Dieter is the center. I don't know when's the last time he started center. It wasn't last season with the Dolphins because he didn't do anything but play special teams. And uh, Elias Sports Bureau sent me an interesting stat yesterday that uh, going back to 1960, C.J. Stroud and Jared Patterson, the only rookie combo to start the first seven games, Hmm. those two. But that that streak is over because Patterson is out with a fractured fibula. 
and could may miss the rest of the – probably going to miss the rest of the season. So, And we have no idea when Juice Grugs is coming back from his hamstring injury. So I think they're going to struggle big time to run the ball, not to mention the Bucks are good against the run, giving up 98 yards and ranking 10th. Yeah, this Scruggs hamstring, this is like the most debilitating hamstring injury I've ever seen on an athlete. This is we're we're going on almost three months with a hamstring injury. What are we doing? This is kind of like last year with Derek Stingley Jr. missed nine games with it. He did, he did, but that was just, it was the last nine games, and it, that was one of those things. I almost felt like they were uh you know, the 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 importance of those nine games, John, I think it's undebatable. Like those were just you know, those there were throwaway games. Uh but you're right. You know, I mean, Stingley's a whole nother. That's a whole and those games were important for him. Uh, yeah, probably. You're right. Is. From an experience standpoint. No, you're right about that. You're right about that. All right. What's next? I've got to go with CJ Stroud. There's all these stats out there about how his performance has been dwindling over the last three or four games because teams have figured out what he was doing well. Now Bobby slowing Stroud to have to figure out how to adjust. It would help if they have a running game which they don't, even though in the last four games their their rushing has improved over what it was, but it's still it's it's still bad. We see it, but I think they're like twenty fifth in rushing now, which is amazing to me. Other teams are having more problems than they are, but it's hard for Stroud to do better when he has no running game. And Bobby Sloick continues to run on first down. There's nothing surprising the defense putting Stroud in bad situations. At that game in Carolina, Stroud was off target on a lot of passes, more than he has been. And also, it was his worst game when he was blitzed. Todd Balls is known as a creative blitzer, so I'm guessing he's going to come after Stroud from every angle and try to show him things that he hasn't seen. John, I'm actually, that's kind of music to my ears, honestly, that they blitz. Well, first of all, they blitz the third most in the league, but they're 31st in QB pressure. So regardless of the fact that they're blitzing, they're not getting home, the Buccaneers are. So they blitz a lot, but they're not that great at getting the quarterback on the ground. That needs to be pointed out. And CJ's had games where he hasn't been sacked with with much worse offensive lines than the one he's probably going to be playing, but like talent-wise, worse than the one he's going to be playing behind. I'm kind of assuming Laramie's playing only because – he he missed Wednesday. He misses Wednesday practice every week. Are you hearing something different about Laramie, John? It sounds like you think he might miss this game, but he missed mm-hmm. Wednesday practice the last couple weeks. He's got a recurring knee issue that bothers him. Yeah, it's not going to get better when you're playing. Right. Um, but as far as CJ goes, well, Tampa Bay's defense blitzes a lot, but isn't good at getting pressure. And CJ's passer rating against the blitz this year so far is 117. Like he tears up teams that blitz him. I'd much rather see a blitzing team, John, than these teams that they played the last three weeks that are just sitting back in these in these zone shells and making CJ get agita about throwing the ball down the field. So um, I, I'm actually okay with playing the Bucs. We'll see. I mean, not every blitz is is executed the same. As you mentioned, Bulls does some exotic stuff out there. But I'm kind of glad he, that there's a chance he's not seeing the same style of defense that he's seen the last few weeks. The trend for Stroud is his Raiders rating has gone down every week over the last five weeks. Yeah. And uh, one of the things like Carolina didn't blitz a lot, but when they did, he was bad against it, which makes that statistic you just read even more impressive. But he's got to be able to bounce back and have a good game. And a lot of that's up to Bobby Slowick. Yeah, I'm going to use Bobby Slowick here along those lines, John, in mind. It, it, the, you touched on it. I'll dig into it a little bit deeper, and you saw the same chart I did. We may have even talked about this on the last episode, but this is the first actual game that we're talking about here where this changing this trend could be relevant. But the Texans, are uh, they pass the second least amount, the 31st most they pass on early downs, first and second down in games when they're, the games are still – hanging in the balance you know it's not a blowout one way or the other win it win probability is somewhere between 20 and 80 percent they pass the ball as much on first or second down as the cardinals and the giants and teams like that do like literally those are the two teams that sandwich the texans in the rankings the team quarterback by josh dobbs who just got traded for a bag of chips and the team quarterback by some combo poo-poo platter of daniel jones Terod taylor and now i guess tommy devito so the and you look at the names of the quarterbacks that are down in that area of the standings for for how infrequently they throw on first and second down. It's all bad quarterbacks. 
the guys up in the top 10 or 12, they're all good quarterbacks. CJ's a good quarterback. He deserves to be passing in that neighborhood that amount on early down. So Bobby Slowick needs to do more things to, to help CJ Stroud stay out of bad down and distant situations where those blitzes really become super problematic when it's third and eight or third and 10, as opposed to third and short. And the run game is still something you can use to attack a defense like Todd Bowles defense. So this is a, I've said this a couple times this year, but I'm going to say it again here. This is a Bobby Slowick game. Bobby Slowick needs to change some things that he's been doing in terms of the, 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 the makeup of his play calling. One of the things I'd like to see more of, remember early in the game against Carolina when they ran a bootleg, mm -hmm. everybody went to the right, Stroud rolled around the left and ran yeah. for, I think, 12 yards, and he slid. Yeah. He didn't get hit. I'd like to see more of that. And once he can do it, that's going to hold players. They used to work so well for Gary Kubiak when he'd make those calls for Matt, Matt Schaub. And if Matt Schaub can do it, of course Stroud can do it. But I think we'll see we Slowick be a little more creative than he has been since what he's been doing lately has not worked. No. I mean, this, uh, John, the, the way they treat first and second down is very Bill O'Brien-ish, and that's not a compliment at all. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, 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 hopeful of that as, I'm hopeful of that as well. I'll say one thing too, John, about C.J., if he's going to run those little 12, 13 yard little bootleg runs, um, he needs to learn how to slide. He, he dove on his right shoulder to kill the play. Like that's, that's the shoulder he was playing hurt with earlier this year. Let's, let's, let's learn how to, at least if you're going to roll, stop, drop and roll CJ roll on the left shoulder, not the right shoulder. Next time. What, uh, take him over to Minute Maid Park and let them show him out. There you go. There you go. What's your last one, John? My last one is the pass rush because they shut down the Panthers, limited them to 44 yards rushing. And it's interesting, going back to the Indianapolis game, every game they've allowed fewer yards rushing than the previous game, which means they'd have to limit the Buccaneers to fewer than 44. And one of the reasons they were able to get such great pressure, six sacks, two more called back because of penalties. Jonathan Grenard said they had three and a half instead of two and a half. I think they'll shut down the run again, and I think that pass rush will get after Baker Mayfield, who's mobile, and I think uh, you'll see Grenard and Will Anderson Jr. Don't know if Malik Collins can do it again, but if they can get the kind of heat they got on Sunday, they might actually force a couple turnovers, but I'll look for the pass rush to, make, to continue, maybe not six sacks, but continue to uh, show remarkable improvement from the previous six games. Yeah, I don't know if you watched the Buccaneers game against the Bills on Thursday night. That was the night that we were out at the Yellow Rose Distillery. So if you watched it, John, you probably had to watch it on the replay. Uh, no, I didn't watch it. Yeah, I went back and watched it just to because the Texans play the Bucs this weekend. I want to see Buffalo got a lot of pressure up the middle in the interior. And I mean, Buffalo sacked Baker three times. They hit him 10 times. And a lot of it, a lot of it came from the defensive interior. So I'm, I'm enthusiastic. I'm excited. I think, I think this could be another big game from Malik Collins and maybe, uh, maybe Sheldon Rankins too, for the Texans. I got one other thing to add. The Texans are giving up 18.3 points a game. Mm -hmm. That's tied for, I think fourth, the last three years, they gave up 26.7. So that's an improvement of like 18 point, 8.4 points a game. Really and good. it's just a, a remarkable stat. And if they could keep that pace, they would have the second fewest points allowed in franchise history to 2011. Wade Phillips and J.J. Watt's first seasons with the franchise. Total points or average points per game? Average points per game. Okay, so that would be the lowest. Yeah, because they play 17 games now. It's hard to break those counting number records like right. that. Uh, um, but uh, – well, that'd be good, man. Yeah, D'Amico's done an amazing job with that defense, no question about it. All right, along those lines, last one, John, for me, um, and for the six-pack, the corners, Stephen Nelson, and I'm assuming it's going to be Shaquille Griffin starting a corner for the Texans. This will be the best pair of front-line wide receivers that this team will have faced this season. They faced some decent ones. You know, Jacksonville, uh, you know, Calvin Ridley and, uh, and, and Christian Kirk, and you throw Zay Jones in there. That's a nice combination right there. But as far as like the top two guys that are going against your top two corners, um, this, this might be a game where they miss Derek Stingley Jr. Quite honestly, because Mike Evans and Chris Godwin are the best pair of wide receiver ones 
that the Texans will have faced this year. So it's a big game for Shaquille Griffin, big game for Steven Nelson to continue to build on what's been a really good contract year for him. Um, I will have my eyes on the Texans corners. Hopefully that pass rush that you were doling out in the previous bottle of the six pack here does them some favors on the back end. And obviously the safeties play into that as well. Jimmy Ward and, uh, and Jalen Petrie. They better double Evans and make Godwin or somebody else beat them. Because yeah. Evans is just fantastic. He's a beast. The yeah. Last year of his contract, I just can't imagine they're going to let him get away because if they're not very good now, imagine what they'd be without Evans. Yeah, no doubt. All right, John, um, what's your prediction for the game? I'm picking Texans 20 to 17. Okay, I got Texans 24 20. So you, are, you and I are pretty much on the same page. We got the Texans winning and covering. Those are the two most important things right there. Maybe not even necessarily in that order, depending on how big a degenerate you are. Yeah, um, and by you, I don't last mean week you. too. Yeah. Yeah, no, I said 31-19. I was a little off. I, I'm, I'm due. I'm due for a bounce back, John. Big bounce back performance <laughs> in my degenerate gambling. All right. Um, so, uh, so John and I are both picking a close Texans win. If that's the case, should be a hell of a day out at NRG Stadium. Weather's supposed to be beautiful, so hope to see you guys out there, if you're tailgating, stop by the uh, pregame show. Southeast corner of the stadium, kind of outside Bud Light Plaza, is where you'll find me. You'll find Seth Payne. And at 1115, you'll find John McClain out there chopping it up with me and Seth prior to the game. John, you thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest updates. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.